Hi, everyone, and welcome. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. I'm Anna Olson. I'm Interim Executive Director at the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. And I could not be more excited to get to open the plenary luncheon for the 35th Anne Farron Conference. I also could not be more excited to get to do this in front of a person who was instrumental um, in creating this conference all those years ago, and after whom the conference was eventually named. Welcome, Anne. So among the nearly 500 individuals who registered for the conference this year, 13 of you indicated that you've attended more than 20 Anne Farron conferences. Are any of you here? Anyone here? You might be on Zoom. There's Zara in the back. That is dedication. And I'll be joining that club next year, actually. So we also have over 150 attendees who are here for the very first time. So a very special welcome to all of you. I hope you come back next year. So this being my 20th year attending and, and running this conference, it's been amazing to see over the years how this conference brings our community together to connect with each other, to learn from each other, and to celebrate each other. And for a lot of reasons, to me anyway, this feels more important now than ever. We at CTRL have had a very busy fall semester, joining all of you. We've hosted and co-hosted 79 workshops with nearly 1,800 attendees in total. And I think this more than anything is a testament to your continued engagement and, and your commitment to our student, to this university. And there's more coming. So we just launched our spring workshop series. Uh, you're gonna receive another email from CTRL next week. And um, we have topics lined up ranging from navigating current events and social unrest in class. I know that's a topic that is important to a lot of us. Uh, to student feedback and co-creation for equitable teaching and learning, to several workshops on teaching portfolios, uh, several research methodology workshops on Qualtrics and R. We have a book club. This is the first time we do that. And we will also continue our bi-weekly artificial intelligence in teaching coffee chats for the spring. And I think this topic, or in fact, I'm sure this topic will continue to dominate our work for the foreseeable future in more ways than we actually knew when we chose to give this year's conference the theme belonging and connection in the age of artificial intelligence. And by the way, for the record, I did not ask ChatGPT to, to write my remarks or use a voice synthesizer to remove my Swedish accent. Um, so we have a very exciting plenary conversation ahead of us, and I don't want to delay it much further, but before I pass on the microphone, just a very few quick thank yous uh, for, to all the people really who helped make this conference happen. And, and to begin with, I want to thank the Amfarin Conference Planning Committee, uh, who put the conference program together, and also all the presenters who are out there running these sessions. I want to thank the members of the CTRL staff who've been working hard and still are, Thank you all for all you're doing. Thanks to Chartwell Carter, uh, Cartering, Chartwell's catering to the university event staff for setting this space up for us, to the AV staff for the microphones and so much more. And let's see, where is Lindsay? So a very special thanks. I gave it away to CTRL's Lindsay Studer. Lindsay, where are you? Oh no. <laughs> So Lindsay, who is behind the master plan for making this conference happen, down to the smallest details, it would not happen without her. So thank you, Lindsay. Please, when she come into the room, let's cheer for her. So now, though, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our acting provost, Vicki Wilkins. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. And I want to add my thanks to everyone involved, for you, for your leadership of CTRL, and for your work to get this conference brought together, and just executing on so much of what we care about here at AU. So congratulations and thank you. It's hard to believe this is the 35th year of Anne Farron. Uh, and given that, I 
glad to see we have people who have attended more than 20 years. And it also makes me want to thank all of the faculty, staff, and students who have volunteered to share their expertise as presenters and panelists over the last two days. And thank you to everyone who's joining us for lunch today. We have folks in the room and some on Zoom. Sorry to Zoom, they're missing the food. Um, but it really says something about this community that 450 people, more than 450 people, registered to attend. It's truly impressive. This annual event is always a significant milestone at AU. And for those who have not spent most of your academic career here, at AU, you might understand how exceptional this is. When I first arrived at AU, it was in July of 2014. By August, I started hearing about Ann Farron. Now, I want to be fair and say I didn't see it written out. And I was like, what is an Ann Farron? Because you guys talk about it like a cult. And it kept coming up, and people would talk about it. And I'd be like, what is this thing? And then in January of 2015, I had my first opportunity to attend the Ann Farron Conference. And I'll never forget walking in to across an MGC and to a full room and just thinking, I cannot believe all these people took time away from writing their syllabi to come and be at this event today because they care so much about our students. And so I just wanna applaud that and again say, it really distinguishes us as a university and all of you live that out every day. Uh, either at the conference or in what you do in your classrooms, your offices, uh, to help our students. And then I realized when I got to the conference, there is an Ann Farron, and that it was a name that everybody was saying all the time. And today, I have the honor of introducing our namesake, Ann S. Farron. She is a distinguished fellow at the American Association of Colleges and Universities. She began her affiliation with American University in 1971 as an adjunct member of the School of Education. She later served in a variety of administrative roles, including Associate Dean of CAS, Director of General Education, Associate Dean of Faculty, and one we shared, <laughs> Acting Provost. She then served as Vice President for Academic Affairs at Redford University in Virginia and provost at American University in Bulgaria. She received an AB in economics from Radcliffe College of Harvard University, an MAT from Harvard Graduate School of Education, and an EDD from Boston University. As a consultant on campuses both in the US and abroad, she has encouraged curricular and pedagogical reform as stimuli for faculty and institutional development. Her publications focused on improving teaching and learning, strategically realigning resources, developing collaborative academic leadership, and using institutional research data to inform decisions. And as one of two keynote speakers at the inaugural teaching conference organized by AU's Faculty Senate and Faculty Development Com uh, Committee in 1990, to honor her commitment to pedagogy, the conference was then named after her in 1995. Today, as a testament to her leadership and legacy, I now introduce and welcome Anne Farron to the podium. Well, I've been delighted to have been given five minutes to speak to you. And I, too, have to acknowledge that I did not use AI in order to produce this. You know, 35 years is a really long time for a good idea to stay a good idea. And I don't want to put this up there with things like Kleenex or anti-lock brakes, but it really shows the sustaining power of something that really is worth doing and doing over and over and making it better all the time. The first conference, I have to confess, was aimed at trying to get people out from behind closed doors, willing to share their successes and their failures. There was no help at that time. Unlike research, there were not conferences to go to. There was no feedback. Uh, in fact, uh, I think collaboration with another faculty member was frowned on because team teaching was not efficient. You know, that was too costly. So most of us, I think, went into our classrooms every single semester thinking, wow, maybe this time it won't work. And so we had no one to rely on. So I got this idea with a lot of other colleagues, because we're all talking the same language, of how can we 
talk about what's going on and how can we get help. And that first conference, I have to say, to kind of pump up the enrollment at it, we had like 35 minute sessions with five people on a panel. I mean, we really wanted to get as many people as we could there. And they were given five minutes to give one great idea of something they did. So I can remember an economics professor saying, I come to class early, I talk to a student, I get his name, then when I start my class, I say, well, Jim's not really convinced that the Federal Reserve is aggressive as it should be. And that makes all the students think he knows everybody in the class, cares about all of them, knows their names, et cetera. And someone else was saying, well, if you want small group discussion, use the decibel theory. Loud students get grouped together because then at least someone will have to listen every now and then. <laughs> Put the quiet students together and then somebody will talk and that will work for you. I don't think, I mean, all those quick tips were great, but I don't think they're sufficient for the complexity of what we're doing today on our campuses. <clears throat> so I wanna show you how far we've come. Um, I can still remember 30 years ago, at least, when a faculty member in biology was gonna have his five minutes to say how he introduced a new topic. And he wrote on the board in about three foot high letters, race, and he could just feel the air go out of the room. Faculty quit talking, there was quiet everywhere, and he said, what did I just do? And he pointed out that if we could not talk about it, we could not explore it, we could not ever unpack it, understand it. And he thought it was really important to just put things out there big. Now that seems almost quaint, considering how much we are able to talk about race and equity and all the issues that we are confronted with. The thing that bothers me right now though, is I don't think that we're comfortable with a lot of the initiatives. Just a few years ago, you were talking about equity inclusion and think about what's going on on other campuses, in law firms, every place. Campuses are fraught spaces. Faculty are dealing with issues, poverty, oppression, indifference, violence, and not as curricular topics, but as part of the lived experience of your students. And I have heard over the years all the ways that you are ramping up to support your students. But I think it's a daily challenge to sort of walk into that classroom, figure out where that invisible line is of what you can say. Make sure you don't touch that live wire and blow up your class or a career. We have seen that happening. So I'm encouraging you to do it what we did 35 years ago. Don't go back behind closed doors. I don't think you would. But don't choose to teach only safe topics. Don't try to make all your students comfortable. And don't be afraid to share your own views. You cannot be authentic in the classroom. It is the most public place where you are seen and understood and you are able to show how you have a life of the mind and how you care about things. What I think this conference does is every single year reassures you with some guidance, some uh, support, some encouragement, and some protection so that you can do what universities stand for, the free exchange of ideas, and that there's not some right way to think and that everyone is welcome with their views. So understanding and managing artificial intelligence is just your latest challenge. I have learned more about it in the last day and a half than I knew. I'm not sure I can retain it all. But I'll tell you, one of the great things about being invited here every year, usually I just get to wave. It's time I get five minutes. Um, I never planned to be an academic. It is the greatest gift. I backed into it as a career and I got paid my entire life to learn. I can't think of anything that is better than that. But American University was my very first home I stayed here a long time, and I thought it was a privilege to be with so many people who believed, as I do, that education can repair the world. So I want to thank you for inviting me, thank you for sustaining this conference, and thank you to all the people who've made this possible. You all make it look effortless. Thanks.
Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, and now to introduce someone that needs no introduction in this room, uh, our 15th president of American University and the first woman to serve as president, Sylvia Burwell. President Burwell has spent the past seven years helping AU excel as a leading student-centered research university. Under her leadership, AU has more than doubled research funding from external organizations, launched a $500 million Change Can't Wait campaign, and we're within about 43 million of hitting that goal, created four new research centers, eight endowed faculty chairs, 152 scholarships, and established one of the largest investments in student thriving this university's ever known with the $109 million student thriving complex. For me, she's always been a true partner, a mentor, and someone who has been there to support my efforts. We share a love of cowboy boots and a love of Christmas decorations and just enjoying our students and spending time here on campus. As she embarks on her final semester as president, President Burwell continues to lead with a focus on community, inclusive excellence, and student thriving. Of course, you may know prior to joining AU, President Burwell held two cabinet positions in the US government, serving as Secretary of Health and Human Services and Director of the Office of Management and Budget. She also held leadership positions at two of the largest foundations in the world, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Walmart Foundation. Please uh, join me in welcoming our president, Sylvia Burwell, to the podium. <laughs> Vicki, thank you so much for the introduction, for your leadership, and, and most of all for our partnership uh, in terms of this incredibly important work. And Anna, thank you, uh, and CTRL, the whole team. Lindsay, uh, thank you. Uh, let's give Lindsay a hand now. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and we knew you were, but we wanted to honor you and make sure you know how much we do appreciate it. And because this conference for me, it continues to be a highlight and a great way that we start our year. And I've done it uh, every year um, that I have been here because it is such a great way for us to engage and invigorate right here at the beginning of the semester. Um, and of course, Anne, uh, a huge thank you to you uh, for the vision that came to life and this vision as you said that is something when you have a great idea like this that it has the staying power of 35 years and it has the ability to evolve and change uh, in terms of the core idea being at the root, but how you do it uh, each year we learn grow and, and do better so Anne, again a big thank you to you. Um, and to all of our teams that are here today, all our faculty, uh, we're joined also by staff, everybody here in the room getting food and those online uh, uh, who aren't, we're thinking about you and the food. Um, thank you all. And it's great. Uh, and I hope that everybody, I was talking to a few folks, I hope everybody did get a chance to recharge uh, and spend a little time with friends and family. Uh, over this break uh, and that we can all come back ready to go. Yeah. I will say I actually spent the holidays trying to keep up with my mother and my mother-in-law who were both here uh, visiting us uh, and in my mother's 88. And I will tell you, I don't exactly know how, it was a little hard to keep up with them both. And I'm not sure why the two of them create more dishes than our teenagers, but it is true um, that that uh, did happen. And as we welcome our students back on campus, I'm sure you see a few out here in terms of orientation for some of our new students that are transferring. Um, and as we start on Monday, I hope that you all feel the same sense of hope um, that I do. And part of why I love Ann Fearon is because we come together as a community and this community never fails to inspire me. And I hope you have that feeling as a part of what we're doing over today. And as I start my final semester, um, I'm feeling particularly inspired. And I'm inspired by all of you, by our faculty and that work um, that you do, that work that caused that funding to happen in terms of the recognition of that incredibly important work, that work that you do um, inside and outside the classroom and our staff that are here too, um, all of that work together. And it's the magic that happens day to day in the classroom 
uh, that Anne was talking a little bit about to that incredible scholarship uh, in terms of all you provide. And finally, to the community, and Vicki mentioned this, th this issue of the community that we build on this campus and beyond. Um, and that is how this group delivers impact in so many different ways. Um, and a big congratulations to Diane. I don't know if Dan is here or online in terms of the leadership of her and her team working with all of you uh, on that doubling, but also just wanna mention, you know, a no number of our faculty experts we secured a $5.7 million NSF grant. And I love what this grant is about. Um, it is the first ever accelerating research translation program, uh, which will help us speed and scale impact. And AU was picked to do this because we are a place that already does that. We think that way. We, the, it's not, the idea of an ivory tower is not what we're about. We're about that creation of knowledge and moving it not just creating it, but moving it so it has impact. And I love that we have been recently recognized for that. And that's just one example. I could keep going, but I have limited time so we can get to the panel. Um, and I will also just mention that, you know, next year I'll be sitting with you Let's uh, and enjoying the Unfair and Conference uh, as a member and uh, joining the faculty. And I'm very excited to do that. But until then, we've got a lot ahead of us. Um, we have a lot of great things. We have some challenges that I think we need to do. But today we are here to talk about the topic of generative AI. And that is a topic that's full of challenges and opportunities for all of us. And much of AI's discussion centers on the disruptive qualities and some of the negative things, more challenge than opportunity. Uh, but I'm hopeful we can spend time on both today. Um, and I know that there's a lot of work going on. You all have been discussing it uh, to address the way that AI intersects with everything from academic integrity to our um, what we teach our students, how we teach our students, how we run our university. Um, and so excited to do that. Uh, Assistant Dean for Academic Integrity, Allison Thomas, who's here for us today, is one of our panelists. And I think everybody knows she is leading the effort um, to overhaul our academic integrity code. So we make sure that it can account for these changes that we're seeing. And she's going to speak to that. Uh, and uh, fellow panelist and Professor Emeritus, who will be up on the screen with us, Naomi Barron writes in her later, latest book, who wrote this, that no matter how efficient and smart we may perceive AI tools to be, she writes that those tools can't replace human creativity. Um, and these are only a few of the things that hopefully we're going to get to. And focus on the opportunities to uh, the doors that AI tools can open, uh, the way AI can change the way what we teach and both the way we teach it. So in short, we're gonna hopefully cover in this panel how we can help this to sow progress, um, whether it's mitigating the challenges or taking advantage of the university, the opportunities. So now uh, it is my opportunity. Um, if all our panelists can come on up and I will introduce everybody. And if you can wave, come on up and have a seat, please. Um, I'll introduce everybody and then we will get started. We're gonna do, I'm gonna do some questions and then we will shift to questions from everybody else. Um, Naomi, welcome, we can see you up there. Um, and we'll switch. I am gonna say, I'm gonna apologize, but I think I'm gonna turn the questions over to Anna for the questions from the group, because my apologies, but I am going to uh, catch a plane because yes, we still have $43 million to go in this campaign. And I am on my way um, to my last trip to California uh, to see what we can do to close that gap. So my apologies, but let me introduce, um, Allison, as I mentioned, is AU's Assistant Dean for Academic Integrity, and she's taught at AU since 2005 in the Department of Literature and the American Studies Program. And she spent the past year working with you, you all, our faculty and our students, across the campus as we rethink teaching strategies and the responsible use of generative AI tools. Welcome, Allison. Gihan, everybody knows Gihan Fernando, is the Assistant Vice Provost of AU's Career Center. Uh, I was meeting with a student earlier today, sending them your way, Gihan. And he has extensive experience in higher education administration with a focus on career services. And his interest in generative AI uh, is focusing on its impact on the future of work. Gihan, thank you for joining us. 
Jerome Clark. Joined the AU faculty as an assistant professor in the College of Arts and Sciences Department of Philosophy and Religion. And Jerome writes on technology ethics and is, is working on a book that looks at the theory of racism in light of algorithmic harms in contemporary institutional life. Jerome, welcome. Glad you're here. Juan Ho Lee is professor and chair of the Department of Information Technology and Analytics. His research includes responsible AU digital transformation and cybersecurity. And his expertise has been sought by South Korea's Presidential Committee on the Fourth Industrial Revolution, Samsung, the World Bank, and many others. Welcome, welcome. Naomi Barron is Professor Emerita of Linguistics in AU's College of Arts and Sciences and the former Executive Director of CTRL. Mm -hmm. She has been studying the effects of technology on language for more than 30 years and has written several books on the topic. So when it comes to AI's promise and perils, she's focused on the impact of foundation model on writing in terms of motivation and skills. So welcome, Naomi. We're so glad to have you. Thank you for joining us online. Thank you. All right. I am going to start us off uh, kind of limiting the scope in one way, but making it big in another way. I would like each of you to tell us your number one opportunity and number one challenge that you think generative AI presents to us. I am speaking slowly so you can have an opportunity to think. And Naomi, we're going to start with you. That makes it easy. Uh, I can't promise this is the biggest opportunity, but I think it's a huge one, namely taking intractable problems that human minds have been working on and haven't been able to solve and getting computers to make that possible. So I'm thinking in particular of medical challenges. I'm thinking of what DeepMind did in figuring out how to unfold protein folding and looking at what's going to happen with the coming of new viruses that we hope we nip in the bud. For biggest challenge... I think the biggest challenge of today's AI is for us to know what is true and therefore for us to know. I'll leave it at that. We can come back to the ramifications. Thank you. And I'm so with it. And we could do an entirely different <laughs> on that last little part, especially in the context of what's happened in higher ed recently. And I'm sure you all can imagine we could go, I'm not going to, I'm not going to detour. So we're going to keep focused, keep focused, but thank you, uh, Naomi, but maybe a topic for next year's Ann Farron. Um, why don't you begin? Uh, and let's go, we'll go down the line here. Yes. Um, the biggest opportunity with AI, Gen AI, uh, in my opinion is it has the potential to you know, increase our personal productivity exponentially, maybe not by twice, maybe by 10 times. It allows us to focus on high value and mission critical crucial tasks while leaving mundane time consuming low value tasks to the machine. On the other hand, uh, the biggest challenge uh, is how we govern and control AI, Gen AI, so that it won't be used to harm humanity. Uh, the challenge is uh, companies are not necessarily incentivized to address this issue by themselves, and government regulations and policies are very slow in responding to emerging issues brought by AI. Thank you, and you have just teed me up for a question I'm gonna come back. I'm gonna come back to you on. Gihan. Um, I have a similar response on the opportunity side uh, to both what Naomi said and what uh, Ruang Hu have said, which is sort of the idea of efficiency, right? Like how this can make us all much more productive. Um, finally, I came up with one of the exact same examples that Naomi used, which was uh, protein folding. I'm not a scientist myself, uh, but reading about this or hearing about this just to give those of you who are not familiar with this idea, it used to take a PhD, like a whole length of their PhD to identify the structure of one protein, which is what this, this uh, protein folding ref references. Um, with uh, AlphaFold and other uh, technologies, they have 
been able to find those structures of 200 million proteins in just a couple of years, right? So that that sort of gives you the scale of development and understanding the structure of these of these proteins is critical for development of vaccines and solving, uh, you know, curing genetic diseases and other very significant parts of our lives um, that can be such a positive. Um, on the negative side, I, I worry about um, the end of the world, the, the you know the potential destruction. Um, but more in my field of work, I I do worry about the significant disruption that is going to be becoming, I think, inevitably to the world on the scale of the industrial revolution. And how do we deal with that? And we'll talk, I'm sure, more about that too. In just yes, a moment. yes, yes. And and I would just add on the protein folding, think about antibiotic resistance and how these tools, we, we haven't had new antibiotics in so long. And these tools are going to be incredible in helping us get there in terms of, you know, if uh, in terms of what's happening in the world in those areas. But we'll, we'll keep going. Jerome. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I think that um, we're probably clearly living the challenge currently. Um, in a span of a year, uh, software without a clear value proposition has upended and um, justified the restructuring of institutions the world over. Um, and I think, take humanistic teaching, I guess my ministry, um, these AI products streamline all the tasks of composition uh, in the form of queries, uh, and therefore, it kind of forces us as educators to uh, change or de-emphasize um, the teaching of certain intuition to our students. Um, or we'll have to deal with many May-Decembers of grading machine outputs after machine outputs. Uh, I think that if we're honest with ourselves, we have to deal with how this technology can restructure our institutions in the form of consolidations and layoffs, especially as many of the folks in this room and tuning in are term and adjunct faculty, especially as departments might even feel like they're in the crosshairs uh, in the wake of this technology. But we should also think about how this technology is restructuring what it is we do, um, the purposes that we're trying to move towards uh, in our classrooms. Um, so yeah, I think that's an opportunity. Um, not to be self-aggrandizing, but uh, as a philosophy person, I think it is an opportunity to pause and reflect. Thank you, Allison. Thanks. That was a that was a great setup. Thank you. <laughs> I think um, first opportunities. I, I can talk specifically about about my slice, which is this is my dream. We're all talking about academic integrity. I've been waiting for this moment. I feel like um, if I really reshape this as an opportunity, it's like my, my ship came in. I've really been waiting to have these these conversations with you all, um, and and I think, but to extend that, uh, what I what I really mean is, I think AI forces us to think about what the academic project is. What are we doing? Why are we doing it as faculty, as staff, as students? Um, and that means looking at academic integrity, not as a list of stuff you can't do with punishments that come in tandem with that. It means thinking about academic integrity as a sort of habit of mind that involves skills and concepts and deep knowledge that's not gonna come from a paragraph on a syllabus. So I'm really, um, I I've been waiting for this moment. I'm excited we're talking about it. I'm excited that, um, we're having conversations that begin to reconceive of academic integrity in this in this light. Obviously, that is also a challenge. Um, as a faculty, in particular, on the on the heels of a, a COVID upside down times for folks who, as a university, uh, many of us didn't have experience with online teaching, for example, and had to learn how to rethink our assignments and our coursework. Uh, we're on that level. This is a restructuring that's requiring that level of engagement and work. That's a lot. It's really overwhelming um, for our faculty um, to be learning about this while also trying to create some guardrails and some guidance and some meaningful teaching for students. So I think, um, and I think that gets at even the larger educational questions, which is what does it mean for AU to credential a student? 
uh, to say a student can do something, that they're capable of doing something. Uh, generative AI certainly poses, you know, the question that I hear from a lot of faculty, which is, how do I stop students from cheating? Uh, but I would reframe that to uh, sort of how can I make sure students are doing authentic work for which I can give authentic feedback, for which then the university can make an authentic accreditation or credential to say, yes, the student can be held responsible for knowing or being able to do these particular things. So I think it presents, it, th there are enormous challenges all, all, all around, uh, but I think the opportunity to engage in it in this way uh, is particularly exciting, not just for me personally, but I really do think for all of us. Thank you all, thank you all. Um, Guan Ho, I'm gonna come back to you and kind of combine a little something that Gihan said and, and, and you said and ask you uh, uh, about it. And it has to do with, I was at a conference discussing some of the, you know, I was somewhere where people were discussing this issue of generative AI and the progress that it is making, the speed with which it is quote, progressing or, quote, becoming smarter. Don't know if those are even the right words that we should use to, to describe it. And that um, the speed of that, without slowing it down and without appropriate regulation, what the uh, hypothesis said was, you know, the, what the person posited was, well, one of two things will happen. We're going to become pets or become extinct. Uh, in terms of the question of what can happen when generative AI becomes, quote, smarter than we are. And so I'd love for you to comment on uh, the likelihood of an existential threat or what does that look like from your experience um, in terms of a uh, threat to us? Yes, that's a great question. Um... So, um, so last year, so we witnessed uh, a tipping point in Gen AI development. Uh, it's almost like you go to bed one night and the next morning you wake up to a complete new world, right? So, but uh, the fact is, you know, the many big tech companies like Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, IBM, they've been developing Gen AI tools and foundation models for many, many years. But then open AI surprised them by releasing ChatGPT on, I remember the date, November 30th, 2022, one month before the beginning of 2023. So what happened next is incredible, as you know, right? The, the ChatGPT had a, you know, fastest growing user base. Nine six four oh six four oh seven eight seven two eight five nine. Lynn, hi, it's Naomi Barron. Uh, my screen has frozen.
stunts uh, triggered by rogue AI or malicious actors, you know, utilizing AI. But I wouldn't say it will be an existential threat to humanity and they will find a way to protect us because AI will enable bad actors, but it also empowers good actors to protect us from those attacks. And sorry, just gonna continue just one more click and then Allison, get ready. Um, just the question of, uh, you said, you know, it's a, it's a matter of the players that control. And so I think at the root of this question is, is there a world where humans no longer control it? That we don't understand or can control it. The example that was given was like, well, we don't know why it learned a language. That at one point, you know, the technology, I can't remember what language it was. Uh, maybe it was around. I can't remember what language, but the technology just learned the language. And like nobody knew, like, why did the technology learn the language? That it gets to the point where it's beyond our that's the uh question. What do you think about is there a place where it gets beyond the control? Yeah, that that's uh the tough question to answer, but there, there is actually a very You know, interesting article published by. Um, take an example, a quick example of today's Gen AI tool like ChatGPT. We think ChatGPT is super intelligent already. When you ask something to do, it generates documents, plans, and speeches, and and so on. But ChatGPT is not really intelligent. I, I think intelligence is a misnomer for for uh, ChatGPT as as you now, because what it does is recognizing patterns or Prediction associations word. of different words. It doesn't know what they means, but they know they, how they are associated with each other, you know, and then Salem patterns, and then they present in a way that, you know, is organized. But I don't think that engine, the model itself has really intelligence in there. It's not meaning it's prediction. Allison, I had sent a question to you, but I'm throwing that out the window because of what you said. So sorry. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of, because of what you said, I just would love, and I think it would be helpful for all of us to hear how you specifically think about this opportunity of, you know, instead of viewing this as a, a, a question of you can do this and you can't do that, and this is forcing us in a direction, can you talk a little bit about how you think, because we're having to do it real time, how we should think about what is it that we need to teach or what skills do we need to impart? Um, and how do we get to thinking about that as the driver for the answers to these questions? Because I think that's where you were going and would love to hear like, can you help us? We're all working on this. Um, so how do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, some of the related, I, th I think one of the questions is about sort of where we're okay with substitutions being made or shortcuts being taken and where we're not. And so uh, for me and in, uh, in classes I teach in the writing program, for example, um, the struggle has to be with the decision-making of putting words on the page and with making choices about research and examining research and assessing research um, and the skills to uh, make those choices. And so if a student is sort of shortcutting that or substituting for that using a generative AI tool, then they're not getting the most out of their opportunity. And I'm certainly not able to assess them in a, in a meaningful way. And so I think for faculty giving guidance about not only what's okay to use as a tool in really specific terms, because generative AI is not a, it's not a monolith. We can't just use that term and it, it mean the same thing for all these tools are all different. They all work in different ways and offer different, um, different kinds of, uh, uh, sort of strategies, I guess. Um, and so I think being really specific about what tools are okay to use and what are not, but also why, why is it okay for me to, uh, the example I always use in presentations, why is it okay for me to use the PowerPoint designer to suggest layout and design, uh, and 
And in what context would it not be okay? And so really emphasizing some of the contextually based um, information that needs to inform our decision-making about whether to use generative AI in a particular, particular situation or not. I think those are things that our students will need help navigating. And, and what we lose from, from not getting into those deeper conversations and not putting those transparent and specific guidelines is um, students accepting answers that they may get from a generative AI tool without the skills or knowledge to really critique it, right? I mean, the example that a lot of folks use uh, to the analogy is the calculator, right? Um, we need students to be able to to do math, uh, to offload that sort of cognitive process to a calculator is a shortcut, but we don't wanna replace the ability to do math with a calculator. And as generative AI evolves, it's sort of like, I've seen some folks wonder if we're not really talking about a calculator, we're talking about like a mad scientist's assistant um, that's more like mostly obedient, but also a little erratic. Um, and, and so I think, um, if, if you're a student and you haven't really parsed through some of the information literacy learning, what is authority, how do we value information, who gets information, who gets to make and access information, um, then you may not have the, the tools you need to, to critique that, to critique the output of the tool. If you're accepting it, if you're depending on it, if you're relying on it. Um, that doesn't just have implications for what you can do in your next class or even what you do as an AU graduate, but sort of the citizenry. If we end up uh, with, with a citizenry that can't really tell the difference between um, uh, or can't can't add numbers, for example, like what does that what does that mean? Are we okay? Are we okay with that? Um, so kind of defining where shortcuts are okay, where it's okay to offload particular work um, and where it's not, I think that transparency is where to start across the curriculum, across student experience, not just one time. Um, and that's sort of the drum I've been banging on for a while about academic integrity related to AI, but not all, but also not related to AI. So I feel like um, musical accompaniment is happening now. Does that answer your yes, question? Yes, thank you. It seems like you're also distinguishing in, in some ways between content and analysis, um, but that becomes a hard thing to do as well. And the content can be wrong. Yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of related to the question of um, like mastery versus experience. Like in some contexts as faculty, we are asking students to demonstrate mastery. But if you're asking a question that can be simply answered by a machine, um, it's worth thinking about whether that's a question you really want to ask. Um, if you, uh, what I think oftentimes we really want to see is we want to see students thinking. We want to see an explanation or a description of students' experience. Um, and so I think for, for as faculty, that's hard to revise a course towards those kinds of questions when sometimes we do really need to see, like, do you actually know the capital of Peru? Um, but we have to come up with other mechanisms for asking those kinds of questions if we really do wanna know the answers. Thank you, I could ask several more, but we're gonna keep going. Jerome, um, Jerome, you, you started a little bit on this path in, in when you were talking about uh, the opportunities and challenges, but can you go a little deeper on what do you consider the pro most prominent ethical implications of uh, generative AI. You, you were kind of going through um, a list, but wh why don't we kind of revisit that in specific terms? And what do you think are, uh, as we, you know, here are the list of the top five most important implications ethically. Um, I think uh, one that goes, uh, that gets alighted often when we are discussing how we might experiment with these technologies in education or um, uh, as like an email replacement, et cetera, is that um, is the ecological cost of these technologies. And not so much uh, in terms of how much CO2 they exhale or um, how much electricity they take, but most of the data centers that run these technologies uh, are extremely thirsty. Um, about 20% of the data centers in this country alone are located in uh, drought-stricken watersheds. So this is like billions of gallons of potable water. Um, and I think that one thing that we ought not 
underestimate is when these generative AI tools, yeah, it is a bit of a misnomer, these statistical machines, when they uh, become the backbone of say search engines, when they become the backbone of our institutional affairs, we really just have no clue as to what ecological costs uh, will be at scale. And to get back to, I guess kind of one thing um, that I tried to say in my earlier statement uh, can be su uh, summed down to a term of art by this philosopher of technology, Langdon Winner, uh, called reverse adaptation. The idea that human ends or goals uh, become adjusted to the available technology. This institution's already gamified. I feel like that I have this job is a bit of a like a testament to that fact. Um, we already find ourselves moving towards not truth, but points, um, citation numbers, et cetera. Um, kind of going in line with what was just said, do, what do we want that kind of gamified uh, tendency? Do we want to impart that to our students? Um, that's kind of an open question, I suppose. Uh, and I think that we probably should consider how it's already affecting us. Because I suppose this is like the negative flip side of what is just clearly true, um, the rather exponential increase in our productivity. Are we kind of adapting to this world or are we critically engaging it in any capacity? Um, unlike four years ago, uh, when we all had to become like ed educational live streamers, um, we actually uh, are dealing with a question without the prospect that things will return to normal. We just know that this technology is going to be used by our students and us. But also, we probably shouldn't assume that our students are using this, this technology. They find it to be unwieldy. Uh, I taught a class last semester, a seminar in digital ethics, and though they have quite a few of uh, tips and tricks, you know, uh, maybe you should always include a prompt. Can you make this, sound, this essay sound less robotic? <laughs> um, they, they still find it uh, perhaps too costly of their own time to figure out how to make it work for them. <laughs> so there's a way in which the kind of flip side of automation bias that uh, was just being discussed um, that students might not be able to discern um, whether or not uh, the truth of these machine outputs is, uh, is kind of our own inability to see when, say, Turnitin um, is hallucinating plagiarism just as uh, these machines can uh, hallucinate uh, citations. Um, I think I got to the general idea of this kind of reverse adaptation. Uh, so I'll end it there. Jerome, thank you. Thank you. And I, I think that does get to this, this question of truth, the question of knowledge, and the question of institutions. And as I said, when I was saying there were other topics, you know, that could be an entire uh, another situation in terms of what's under attack and what we've seen in the last weeks. Um, and it's specifically it's all institutions, but specifically higher ed, when you think that the coin of our realm is knowledge creation, knowledge dissemination, and truth. And so we are particularly susceptible, I believe, to the undermining and the attacks that are happening more broadly. But as I said, that is a topic where sh I'm coming right back. I'm getting back on AI, Gihan, Gihan, and we're coming to you, Naomi. Um, Gihan, generative AI appears poised to drastically change as we're discussing what people do at work uh, in terms of what they do at work. And so it's gonna possibly change what employers value 
uh, as they look at our students and, and hire our students. And so what do you think this means for, you know, what would you say it means to some of the work that Allison's thinking about, the work that our faculty's doing in terms of how we approach teaching and preparing our students? Yeah, that's uh, that's a question I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, as you will imagine. Um, so last semester, late last semester, I had the pleasure of hearing a conversation between David Lenhart uh, of the New York Times. Uh, he was interviewed by um, Ron Elvin here on campus. Um, it was a really rich, thoughtful conversation. And I got to ask him at the end of that um, what he thought the impact of AI would be on the workforce and the future. And these weren't his words, but basically what the gist of what he said was, it's a fool's errand to try to predict this, right? And I think that that's wise, that, that it's hard for all of us to know exactly what effect this is going to have. And that's why I identified this particular issue as my like challenge, if you like, when you asked that first question, Sylvia. Um, the other thing he said was was sort of sort of his his substantive answer, if you like, was related to things that Gwen Hu and others have said, which is regulation is going to be important to to manage this across the board. So to try to still make a stab at this and perhaps be a fool in this uh, and run this fool's errand here, uh, since I'm up on this panel with you all, uh, so. One of the things I've tried to think about is what are the things that human beings, at least for now, are able to do better than artificial intelligence, and then aim at those as the qualities that employers and the workforce will value, right? And I'll use the example from my own office. So even before AI was readily available, students could really easily get pretty decent information um, on the web just by running a, a Google search that you know draws on my office's website and many other higher ed institution career offices on what's their resume template, et cetera, et cetera. And in spite of that, they still keep coming in large numbers for individual appointments with my advisors. So that relates back to the plenary yesterday, right? The need for human connection, for relationship, for interconnectedness. And so I think all the work that involves that is more likely to be um, to be safe, if you like, or a little bit more AI proof than uh, those jobs that might be very repetitive and easy to replicate um, and that that lend themselves to this kind of uh, machine learning tasks. And uh, the other thing that, the other value I think that my team provides to students in their advising also has relevance, which is, so you do one of these searches and one of the great strengths of these machines is that you can synthesize huge amounts of information and you know what would have taken a person many hours, if not more than that, to conduct research can literally be pulled in an instant, right? By generating an appropriate prompt. However, that information, the quality of that information and whether it is accurate and whether it is um, ethical, whether it's right or wrong, right? Machines have a much harder time still dealing with those issues. And so, um, I think again, people have these, uh, this better ability to distinguish and to curate information. And this is why students will come to my advisors who have some, and to faculty, to many of you um, and staff across the university to help them distinguish across information that machines can easily pull for them. So I also think about the, the AI uh, tools as just that, as a tool, rather than as a replacement for the skills that students will have I think this has relationship also to the skills and qualities that employers are going to see, right? Both those things. So expertise on the one hand and tied to that is ideas of judgment so that students can use these tools in their work and be able to distinguish between the appropriate 
um, knowledge that they will need to be able to move forward, whatever the task is, in whatever realm it is that they're that they're producing. Um, and then also, as I as I said earlier, the idea of human connection and the skills that go along with that. Um, things like being able to work well with people who are different than yourself, to be able to work well with others just generally on a team, to be able to communicate effectively, to have empathy, to have uh, you know the ability to hold somebody's hand in a situation and uh, comfort them. Right? These are all things that are very difficult for a machine to do. Right? And at least, as I said, for now. Yes, go ahead, and we'll come right to you, yeah, Naomi. Just, uh, I just want to make a few comments uh, uh, to follow up uh, uh, Ian's you know, the talk. Just a few days ago, Chief Justice Roberts said, and I quote, AI won't make judges obsolete, but will transform our work. So I think his statement is true for many other knowledge workers and professional jobs. So a few years back, Oxford research team pictured a very pessimistic picture about the US labor market, saying that AI and robotics will uh, displace 30 to 40% of knowledge workers' job by 2025, I think. It didn't happen. Now they you know, step back and change you know, you know, you know, with a different excuse. But the bottom line is that I think Instead of our jobs being displaced by AI, of course, some jobs will be gone, but uh, what we are going to see more is more cross collaboration between humans and, and AI and machine. And then I know you've been thinking a lot about future work, how we best prepare our students to do that. That's exactly why we need to teach and then uh, guide our students how to work with AI and machines, because that's what's going to happen in the workplace. Thank you. Naomi, you're batting clean up here. And so with that, you get to comment on either my question or if you want to add in, because I know it's hard from uh, being on screen, please feel free to add in on anything, any of the other questions for others. But for you specifically, in terms of AI and teaching um, and how you think about it and all your work, does it change what we teach and does it change and should, should it change what we teach and should it change how we teach? But you you get a uh, in Uno it's like you get the wild card so use it as you will. All right, there are many ways I could approach that, but what I'm going to try to do is offer ten concrete suggestions on how to think about what kinds of issues should come to mind as we design curricula in this looming shadow of AI. And I chose the number seven concrete suggestions because I hearken back to George Miller's paper back in 1956 on the magical number seven plus or minus two, where he said, that's about the number of things that the average person can keep in mind in short-term memory at the same time. So you don't have to remember all of these. I'd be happy to send you the list later. Some of these topics you others have touched on on the panel, but I'll give it my go. Number one. We need to rethink what our goals are in education, and I'll focus specifically on the issues of research and writing. One of the things that students have told us over the last years is if you want us to write something that comes from us, then you're going to have to figure out, OU faculty, how to spend the time talking with us about our ideas, reading what we say, maybe reading a second draft. And until we rethink what kind of pedagogy is necessary to help students feel motivated to do their own research and writing, uh, then we're fooling ourselves. I'll remind us that when the internet started becoming popular and available and data and information were readily at hand, there was a huge amount of rethinking we had to do in education as to what should we be doing in a classroom? How much information should we be giving? How much reflection? How much work ahead of time, you know, the flipped classroom and so forth. So I see this as another kind of moment of saying, there's a technology that lets students do stuff. How do we need to rethink what we want the students to accomplish, what we have as our roles as faculty. And it may take a lot of work of the sort that many faculty, unfortunately, not at AU, but so many other universities haven't put forward an interaction with their students about their ideas. Number two, the importance of distinguishing the process 
from the product. We know that the GPTs can produce all kinds of really impressive stuff. In fact, um, there have been a number of studies done uh, that show that GPT-4 in particular can produce better quality and more quickly in terms of writing and sometimes analysis of fairly straightforward problems than humans can. Okay, but why as we, as an educational institution, do we need to rethink uh, assignments, our curriculum, our goals? Because it's that process of figuring things out, of making mistakes, of making your own corrections, of, of stracking your brain to figure out a better way to phrase a sentence, an argument that becomes part of the learning process. Uh, Betsy Cohen in her session yesterday cited a student um, who talked about not wanting to use these technologies because it undermined his learning. And I think we need to recognize that students are not, not all out for a quick A. Many, many students are out for learning and we need to help make that possible. Number three, beware of what's known as automation bias. This is a concept that um, gained currency uh, with the development of things like autopilot, and it's particularly a big concept in the aviation industry, where if you have a system that seems to be able to do maybe better than what a human could do, why not trust it? Well, there are lots of examples where pilots have trusted autopilots, uh, and the story has not been a happy one. Um, we now know that um, there are a lot of cases in which humans are more likely to trust the results of a GPT, let's say in a, in, a, in a piece of writing that's been done, than they are to trust themselves. And again, there are studies on this saying, you know, if GPT has generated um, a piece of uh, analysis or a piece of text, sometimes one and the same, uh, do you feel the need to go back and fix it up? And in many of these studies, the answer is no. I mean, this looks pretty good. Why should I do anything? But it's number one, it's not always right. Number two, it's not your thoughts in many cases. And number three, sometimes it's wrong. The example I like to give, and I did a lot of this kind of playing around when I was writing my book, um, is with Microsoft Editor, where it tells you your grammar's wrong here, or this is sexist, or this is not inclusive, and it gives you alternatives. And some of them are dead wrong. And if you're not a confident writer, you may say, well, Microsoft spent $13 billion invested in OpenAI and now the GPTs are, are integrated into Microsoft products. It's gotta be right, I've gotta be wrong, right? No. Number four, and some of you have touched on this on the panel already, prepare for contingencies that may not arise. What I used to say to my students is, what do you know when the internet is down? And now one can say, what do you know, what can you produce when ChatGPT or its other relatives might be down? I care an awful lot about what is in somebody's head. That doesn't mean we should go back to memorization as the model of education. But we do know that as one becomes either an educated human being or a professional, and sometimes they're one and the same, you want to become a particular kind of person who can think about the world in particular ways. The example I like to give is that of two kinds of doctors you might have if you have a particularly difficult or hard to diagnose problem. And one kind of doctor is really good at looking things up. And another has had a lot of real world experience, has seen a lot of patients and has thought about things. I'd much rather have the doctor who can reflect on experience and then call on whatever kinds of things to be looked up as possible. Then the doctor who's a real whiz at looking things up. Number five, be a skilled and skeptical mushroom hunter. What do we mean by mushroom hunters? We know that there are lots of mushrooms out there that look really tasty, but if you eat them, you may die. But there are other mushrooms that look really tasty and are and are perfectly fine. So. We know that an awful lot of stuff that is generated by the GPTs is not necessarily accurate. Just ask Michael Cohen, who most recently decided he would look up some law cases using ChatGPT to support uh, his, his testimony against a, a particular individual he used to work for. We'll leave it that way. And the cases were all made up. And um, <laughs> uh, So the question is, 
how do you develop a sense of what's true and what's not true that's generated by artificial intelligence? Uh, well, this is actually exactly the same question we should be asking ourselves about the internet. How do you know what's true and not true? Do you verify? And the answer is precious few of us verify. Sam Weinberg at the Stanford um, History Education Group has done a lot of work over the decades trying to figure out how do you get students to figure, to, to, to bother asking, and then he was talking about internet searches, whether something is true or not true. We must ask those questions. By the way, he has a new book with a colleague called Verified that could out, turn out to be really useful in helping guide students and maybe the rest of us in thinking about these issues. Number six, build and preserve your skills because there's a huge threat from AI in de-skilling. And Allison addressed it very nicely, some of these issues. Um, I'd like to remind us that um, fairly recently in 2015, the US Naval Academy reintroduced teaching the cadets celestial navigation with physical instruments because they were concerned that if there were cyber attacks on the high tech navigation systems, the people in the Navy who were running the ships would be up a creek without a paddle as it were. And number seven, I would like to encourage us, and again, some of the fellow panelists have talked about these issues, is to nurture students' humanity. It has been said by many, many people, not just by Flannery O'Connor, not just by Joan Didion, not just by uh, George Bernard Shaw, not just by William Faulkner, by many, many writers, that they write in order to think, in order to figure out what's in their head. If you let GPT figure out what's in your head, it's not getting your head, it's getting what's in its data set. The notion of being creative in what you produce is part of our humanity. Even if we are not all Michelangelo's or Beethoven's, the little acts of creativity that we engage in help make us who we are. And I would encourage us to find ways in whatever we are teaching um, to help our students remember that. Naomi, thank you so much. And I'm going to thank all of our panelists and I'm going to turn things over to Anna so we can open the conversation. My apologies, as I said, I would love to hear the rest of this. Thank you all so much. I enjoyed and learned from everyone on the panel and I look forward to the conversation, hearing about the conversation, which Anna will catch up afterwards. My apologies and please wish me luck. 43 to go team. All right. All right. Hello. Yes. So uh, we have about, I think, a half hour or so to take your questions. Um, if you're on Zoom, please type them into the Q&A. If you're in the room, raise your hand, and then I will find you and call on you and wait for a microphone so that the people on Zoom can hear you as well. Uh, and then I also have a list of questions that many of you submitted when you registered that we can get to as well. Uh, there's so much to talk about. We'll keep this conversation going into the spring. I see Gwendolyn's hand almost touching the ceiling over there. So let's go ahead and start with Gwendolyn. Oh, there we go. We'll change it out. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the, the panelists. This was really great. So I have one comment um, and then I have a question. So the, the comment is that for many years I was chair of the IRB. So I have a certain number of like, you know, nightmares that come from <laughs> things that would keep me up. And one of them that I just wanted to share um, is that so many of our risk mitigation strategies when we're dealing with human subjects research has to do with de-identifying data. And I currently do not have confidence that even the designers of AI could predict whether or not certain kinds of data would be re-identified. So I'm just gonna put that out there as something that kind of keeps me up a little bit. Um, or a lot. So my question is that AI is not just uh, generative, it's also extractive. And so what that means is so many of another class of risks have to do really with privacy. And as an educational institution, I'm curious as to what the panelists think our role should be 
in teaching about privacy in relation to the system. And if we do believe that we have a role in that, where that should kind of live in the organization and curriculum. So thank you. So do we have any volunteers? Um, I would just, I think privacy is contextual. Um, I think oftentimes students don't necessarily realize who they are um, in context and how their data perhaps could be extracted to serve other purposes. So um, enlightening them to this fact could be helpful. Uh, but also kind of giving them some de uh, degree of awareness of the fact that like, you know, most of, uh, it, it's, it's, that extraction isn't uh, necessarily bad. Um, I say this only because many of the students that I just taught were extremely pessimistic about this point um, to the degree that they, they, they kind of give up on the idea a little bit of privacy. Um, and so perhaps like not feeding into uh, nightmares about this can be helpful actually. Um, and having them reckon with uh, their own, have them actually ask themselves a question on uh, whether or not they would want uh, their data to be used in X, Y, Z, Away, uh, might be a my answer. Um, may I add? Okay, so well, um, I think a few weeks ago, maybe some of you remember that the the Google engineers hacked the ChatGPT and then made it produce names and their you know, their addresses and some personal information as an output of ChatGPT by using very weird prompt. <laughs> So obviously AI presents a different level of privacy infringement uh, challenges going forward. Uh, that needs to be addressed, obviously, I think in two ways. One is better design and engineering of foundation model uh, to, you know, to thoroughly test uh, the model before they release it to the market and also have a, a red team to actually try to hack the system. Uh, to help the design team to, to actually perfect the system. The other side obviously is, uh, is uh, the government role in terms of law and then regulation and policies to ensure privacy. Uh, United States uh, is one of the few countries that doesn't have a national level uh, privacy law. Now they're pushing it now, but if you look at EU, South Korea, Singapore, other you know technologically advanced countries, they all have very, complex and tight privacy law in place. And that does something we need to uh, push uh, as, a, as a country. Thank you, Guan Hu. I think I saw Naomi's hand up. Yes, uh, just briefly, I don't know that in terms of student consciousness, um, and Jerome, I think nicely addressed this issue, um, that that generative AI is going to be any worse for privacy than the internet has been. There have been so there's been so much written about the death of privacy ten years ago, when social media and more when social media suddenly made it possible for an awful lot of stuff to get out there. When the internet made it possible for a lot of stuff to get out there. When advertisers realized um, through Google and, and ads and whatever they could get lots of information about you. So I, I think it's true that a lot of people have become numbed to not believing that privacy is possible. Um, it is definitely the case that other countries such as in the EU and South Korea have figured out otherwise. Um, but I, I think the education method message for students is continue more of what we tried saying about the privacy dangers of being online in the age of generative AI, but I don't know whether the threats are necessarily going to be any larger individually than they already are. My social security number is as vulnerable with the internet as it is with generative AI. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, I think I saw 
another hand. I saw two. Um, so if you could please introduce yourself for Piper, is that right? Yep. Yes. And then also, if you have a question for a specific panelist, if you could just mention who. Piper Campbell from the School of International Service. I have a hunch and I'd like to test my hunch on you and also then ask, uh, a fo I'll follow it up with a second part of the question. So my hunch is that the last place in the United States where employees are going to be able to access generative AI in their work is the executive branch and specifically sort of the national security part of the executive branch. I, mean, I believe that Zoom, straightforward Zoom is still not used by most departments of the US government. Um, so in that space and thinking especially about from the School of International Service, um, students who want to go and work in Intel, work for the State Department, et cetera. Wonder if you have any information about how the executive branch is engaging in the question of use of AI internally, and also any thoughts on how you would communicate to students that a risk of becoming overly reliant on AI in their schoolwork is that they may not be able to use it in the same way in, when they move into professional careers. Can I start? Uh, so obviously, I don't know much about how uh, executive branch is using Gen AI internally, but obviously, uh, many governments in you know, some countries uh, have implemented Gen AI tools externally to better serve citizens and engage citizens and so on. Uh, obviously, you know there is a concern about you know you know the information confidentiality and then uh, privacy inf infringement. If you, you let the government workers use Gen AI tools, but what we are seeing in industry is we are seeing more and more uh, more specialized Gen AI tools targeted towards certain profession with more tighter, much tighter uh, the information security so that they don't, you know, they boost their productivity with Gen AI tools without compromising privacy and information confidentiality. For example, there are a lot of apps for legal services and also financial analysts, uh, they are using specialized Gen AI tools. They, are, they don't use uh, ChatGPT or BAR, they're using very specialized tools uh, to make sure that their client's information you know, doesn't get out uh, when they use the tool. So I sp suspect that the uh, executive branch you know, also might be using something similar going forward and maybe not immediate future, but in the, in the far future. So that's my view. Is this working? Yes. Oh. Um, so I don't know the specifics of, again, of who's doing what and using what. Um, just yesterday, interestingly, on NPR, I heard a discussion of exactly this point, right, where they talked about intelligence agencies um, domestically and um, internationally, other, other countries' intelligence apparatuses using, um, using AI for their purposes, right, for the, the work that they do to gather intelligence. And it seemed clear in that discussion by high-level people in the US um, government, um, an and, and NSA chair, and um, I think it was the FBI director who were being interviewed, that they are absolutely using AI in the work that they're doing, right? So it's not, that's not the question. The question is more, um, what are the limits in terms of how and when you can use these these platforms? As I understand it, most of the um, intelligence agencies don't even let people, as you were as you, as you were referencing, use Zoom. But that's because those could be hacked potentially, and that they're less secure as opposed to that they would use AI in their work, per se. Is my take on it, or at least my understanding of it. Thank you both. Do we have any questions from our Zoom audience? Did see one more person here in the room, already has the mic, Hello. So yes. the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Arif Zahed, uh, Department of Computer Science. Uh, basically, I'm working on artificial intelligence myself, and basically I'm in favor of it for, for technology's perspective. But 
here i based on what i hear i have some some comments on um uh, some of the topics uh basically what i'm thinking is that we are not looking at the big picture the big picture here is not the concern about if the ai can take over or if the student cheating or if we need to lose uh, use a lot of water they, they, I believe they are not the concern. The concern, a real concern here is for last couple of thousands of years so far, the communication between the humanity was the language. And now AI has the mastery of the language. The AI can make much better conversation that we can do with deep intimate relation. And this is a concern here. The AI can make a different sort of religion. It can make a different uh, uh, agenda or uh, the, in, uh, the, the people that may want to use it to um, generate manifesto. Look at this angle that in next couple of months, we have the uh, presidential race and AI going to be seriously a problem because a different group can start different conversation with the others in and getting the AI included. And you cannot convince AI to do something, but AI can, can convince you to do something. Because when you talk to artificial intelligence, it get, start getting better and better and understanding you better and convince you to do something. So when we talk about the extends uh, the threat on the humanity the ai doesn't need to come like a robot or kill someone it convinces another people to kill another people you they they don't need to get engaged directly they have the mastery of the language they they can make intimate deep relation and make people against each other this is the big picture so i'm thinking that this is something that we have to address we need more sessions we need to discuss on this the lawmakers must to get involved for example we have nuclear agency to control the nuclear uh, activities in the world but we have to have the same agency in the level of the united nation to up to to implement regulation for using artificial intelligence because if we just leave it like the, the, the bad guys taking over, they, they can uh, use this technology to uh, manipulate other people. And it's undermined the democracy because democracy is based on a face-to-face -face conversation. You cannot have the uh, freedom of speech for a computer or for a robot. This is with the human with consciousness and the consciousness is the uh, potential of feeling and uh, suffering this is the definition of the consciousness so it is must be mandated that if you have getting engaged in a conversation with a party that you cannot see it should be revealed that if it's uh, artificial intelligence or not so these these the picture the big picture here i think that we need to discuss is about the democracy and the uh, the usage of the artificial intelligence other things i can be all uh, addressed very easily through the policy and regulation and another thing about the academic i believe the approach in for in academic uh, that or teaching in in uh, all the educational establishment is shifting in five to ten years from teacher perspective to a student's need based on the artificial intelligence so this is something that we have to think about thank you very much thank you so much for that contribution uh, anyone care to comment well, i'd love to yes <laughs> let me fire your hand up first sorry if that's okay. Um, as soon as I heard language, my ears uh, doubly perked up. It is definitely the case 
that, and now I'll just talk um, more about language issues, that natural language processing, the ability to quotes, understand and definitely to generate language uh, has improved enormously in recent years in large part because of the new transformer technologies and large, um, and large language models. If you think about the election in the United States, we'll call it four years ago and then four years before that, there was worry about what was being, you know, what trolls that were coming out um, to spread messages that weren't from real people and there were deep fakes, but the quality was such that you could usually figure out it was not a human being. The challenge now, of course, is that the language level has improved enormously as well as the, um, the, the videos. No question about it. But I'm not convinced that just because you can have GPTs generate increasingly sophisticated language, both in terms of argumentation and in terms of eloquence, that that necessarily sways the populace to go in a direction that perhaps is not a good one to go. It is not the case that if you think of political movements, if you think of religious movements, it's not the case that the leaders of all of these are highly eloquent people. They convince by other characteristics of their personality, of the delivery style and whatever. So I'm not worried personally that the level of linguistic sophistication of contemporary models is going to be the big danger. I worry about fakes. I agree face-to-face -face is wonderful, but so much of our lives are no longer led face-to-face. -face. So we have to ask to the extent that we are living virtually, how do we pick the good mushrooms from the bad ones? To go back to my earlier image. Thank you for bringing up the mushrooms, Naomi. You might remember I, I'm a mushroom fan. Yeah, just a quick reaction to to your uh, question. So I don't think I can directly address your uh, the concern, but you know, obviously AI can generate a lot more you know, disinformation, misinformation, deep fakes, and so on, and then it will influence elections, you know, at the larger magnitude. In fact, I was told that actually we are we are just thinking about U.S. presidential election this year, but there are actually this year alone. 5,000 elections around the world at the different level. So think about how much election results can be influenced by deepfakes and disinformation information. That's a real, real threat and challenge. Uh, but having said that, you know, technology can be used in you know, both ways, right? So, um, for example, I'm teamed up with a professor at Boston University and also another professor at Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Tech. Uh, we are uh, working with the Washington Post uh, on a research project now uh, to uh, investigate how the Post uh, new conversational AI tool, which is under pilot phase, uh, influences readers' uh, news consumption behavior and also how it might amplify or decline, uh, the reduces, uh, how it might uh, amplify or reduce the readers polarized views on political or social views like climate change and so on. So again, you know, Gen AI can be used to uh, address some of the, the, you know, the polarized views and so on, um, as much as it can be used uh, negatively. So that's my reaction. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, Jerome, do you want to add? Um, I did want to lift up one thing that you uh, mentioned, which is, uh, I do think there should perhaps be some uh, regulatory oversight for the development of these machines. Um, something maybe even uh, analogous to the uh, FDA or something like that, um, especially as these models are being, uh, by way of API and other uh, means are being kind of proliferated uh, and new uh, companies are being built off of uh, already existing uh, models, for instance. So I agree with that. I will also note that I think for many of the concerns we've talked about, um, including uh, many of the ones that se may seem a little far-fetched, one of the key issues is that these technologies are um, opaque, not like technically, but proprietarily opaque. Um, we are, we've just been talking for however long about 
uh, Microsoft technology. Um, we've just been talking for however long about our students using uh, company products. And by virtue of IP, we do not have access to audit these technologies and these machines in order to perhaps hopefully like regulate or moderate, um, if at all possible, their capacities to influence elections or their capacities to be uh, deployed in social media services, et cetera. I think we should all perhaps strive however we can to push towards breaking down that wall, that proprietary wall, because these technologies are clearly, obviously, by virtue of this whole panel, um, going to be extremely influential for our lives in the future. Uh, in the same way that, uh, I don't know, I just watched a Tylenol documentary about how they, you know, or <laughs> exactly, you know, like, I think that, yes, regulation might have to be the way that we deal with even that issue. Thank you. So I have a question that was submitted by a registrant for uh, the conference that I just wanted to um, share really quickly. We haven't touched on this topic, really, this aspect yet. It's about equity. Um, how can we harness gener generative AI to both create more equitable learning spaces and to prevent inequities? I think uh, one way this technology will be used is that it can make our classrooms rather accessible. All we really need to um, reach uh, hard of hearing students nowadays is a microphone and a projector um, because some of this technology can really, it's really good at speech to text. Um, and so now our classes have closed captioning. That's huge. It also is kind of huge that I think that this technology, um, we talked about translation a little bit. I think that this technology will internationalize uh, the academy. And it'll kind of cut through the latency that it takes for ongoing discussions in academies around the world to reach us. We no longer have to wait for reputable press translations, for instance. Um, we'll still rely on them, and we'll still rely on our language-to-language -language dictionaries, but we can be abreast of conversations that are happening that might influence our own ways of thinking about the world, our own uh, methods that we are deploying, and so on. So I would note that that is one way in which we can make um, a more equitable uh, kind of playground for ideas because more people will be able to be heard. Thank you and so much. Here. Anyone else? Uh, yes. Go ahead. go ahead, Allison first. Allison first. I was just going to say, I think this is a short comment, um, but there's certainly uh, tools that require payment for student use. There's tools that require a payment and there's tools that don't. And so more and more over time, I think for uh, how we're considering using these tools in our classroom or teaching students how to use these tools, we will need to think about what it means to use the free version versus the paid version. What are the affordances of one and not another? Um, Microsoft now has a co-pilot that our students have access to, in, at least in part now. Um, and, so, and so there is a kind of a shared level of accessibility uh, to that. Um, but these technologies are always changing. And we do have students who have and will continue to pay money for more advanced tools. And so I think we need to think about, um, about what that means. I, I also think um, th there's uh, an an accessibility issue when it comes to um, the use of AI technologies for detection. I think detection tools are um, a really hot topic at this at this moment. There there are there are AI tools that are designed now to evade detection also, um, and so I th I think how those tools are deployed, to whom they're deployed, by whom they're deployed, is is an issue that's really important to to think about. Um, not all those tools are the same. I think the agreement across uh, a few different sectors of expertise is that those tools are not reliable to determine if AI was used in a specific context or not. Um, and so I feel like uh, the way we think about detection and e even its sort of side friend, like surveillance, um, I've said this a lot about academic integrity work that I don't think our way through this challenging moment is through detection and surveillance or a kind of um, investment in those technologies that purport to detect. Um, by definition, they're sort of always running behind 
that technology anyway. So I just kind of wanted to mention that. Thank you, Allison. Naomi. Yeah, I'd like to speak about a population that's large and growing both um, at our university and around the world. And that is people who are non-native speakers of the language in which they're apt to function. Now, just talk about English for simplicity. Um, there's the good news and the bad news when it comes to a number of the tools that uh, either are specifically GPT driven or now incorporate GPT into other products, things like Grammarly. So the bad news is at least for a while, some of the GPT detector programs would flag writing by non-native speakers of English who were not proficient, and I see Allison nodding, um, suggesting that because of the criteria used for detecting, um, uh, having used the GPT, these students were targets. They had targets on their back. Uh, GPT-0 claims it's now overcome the problem. I'm not sure that's true, and it's not sure, I'm sure, true, I'm sure, for other tools. On the other hand, there's some really productive uses that many of my professional colleagues around the world who are not native speakers of English who need to write and publish in English. And this also goes for our own students here who are not native speakers of English and not fully proficient, whatever the heck that means. Um, so if you take a tool like Grammarly, and the goal is not to cheat, the goal is not to say, I don't need to learn the rules, I'll just let Grammarly do it for me. It's to learn from them. And in surveys that I've done with students um, who are non-native speakers of English, they've said, I learn a lot from these tools. My English skills improve. It's not just that I get a better grade or I get my paper accepted um, uh, as a result. So I think we need to ask, um, in addition to all the good points already made, um, are there cohorts that we can particularly look to benefit and give more equity to through some of the tools that are available? Yeah, so it's just one quick thing to add to that. So, and also uh, think about the, the our students uh, from underprivileged environment families who may not have a lot of resources, for example. So for them, I think the gen, generative AI tools like ChatGPT is a great gift. For example, they can make uh, ChatGPT act like their peer, their professor, their tutor, their proofreader, uh, their editor, um, their friends, a counselor. So even if they don't have access to the physical resources out there because they come from different environments, I think uh, the Gen AI tools can provide a lot of resources for them to, so that they have a more leveled playing field to begin with. Thank you all so much. Do we have any more questions from the Audience in the room, yes. Just wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Hello, uh, my name is Ethan. I am a graduate student here, but I hope to get into teaching, which is why I come to these conferences. And it's always interesting listening to you all. But something I I wanted to ask that I feel is like a really shift in a big shift in paradigm from like the student perspective, and I want to hear how you guys would respond is like so many students now with AI suddenly have access, very easy access to being able to peruse a lot of information. And I've heard like the horror stories from like, uh, you know, professors doing PhDs and having to spend like years reading through like a bunch of books just to find the right thing. Right. But now you have this AI, which can like just direct you to whatever you're looking for and like a, and I wonder like, if that will change like the way universities work in the sense of like, you know, students usually rely on like this pathway to like study what is apparently like fundamental to these fields. But I feel like so much so often now I see students coming in, for example, I had like a, a class where I think it was like, it was uh, a philosophy class on ethics and all these people were coming in on different backgrounds. Like, you know, East, like I have an Eastern background and I like Eastern philosophy and some people came in on feminist ethics. And it's like, like as a professor, you suddenly have like a responsibility to adapt to all these different perspectives. And I just wonder like, uh, do you feel like this, like how do you feel like this will change like the classroom? Great question, thank you. I'm actually, I'm not convinced that it is actually going to be able to, that it's going to significantly change, at least in the short term. 
right? Because the 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 issue you mentioned of there being just all of these resources and sorting through them, yes, a chat GPT or whatever platform can help you to narrow things down or will spit out an answer. But I think there's still the question of, is this the right answer? Is this the right set of resources? How do you distinguish among these as being what is both like right and wrong, as well as uh, in, in both senses, right? An ethical sense, as well as a um, accuracy sense of that information. That is still going to be the function of the university, um, uh, the, the, both the professor as well as the student, I think, to help students kind of figuring that piece out. And uh, it's sort of what I was trying to get at when I talked about what employers are going to value is, again, it's sort of the mastery or the, the judgment development that helps people distinguish across um, whether the information is the right information or not to use in the work that you're going to be doing, whether it's in a, in the academy or in the workplace. You, you still need the skills to critique the output that you're getting, right? And so if, uh, if a tool gives you a particular source and you're like, hooray, this is exactly what I'm looking for, uh, you still need to have the skills it takes to go look at it, to find it, to make sure it exists, because sometimes it doesn't at this moment. Um, and so that takes particular skills that are learned and some and some of the ability to critique those outputs take longer to learn and take more struggle to learn uh, than 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 others. I mean, I think that investment of uh, skills and how to critique the outputs of the of the tool and then also gets to the, the question of prompting, right? Uh, if you ask an, an easy question, you're going to get a simplistic or sort of vague answer. But if you are designing a prompt in a particular way, and we've had a number of sessions that have talked about um, prompt design in some really specific terms. Um, and so uh, it also takes skill to write a prompt, uh, to ask the kinds of uh, questions at the level of spe specificity that you might ha have a need for, um, takes, takes some skills that require teaching. So. Obviously, I think a lot's going to change, um, but I always sort of think that. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I, I think it. I mean, obviously, it's something we're going to need to respond to. But will it upend our sense of what we do as educators? I think critical thinking and audience awareness and the rec ability to recognize context and the needs of context are still going to be sort of at the forefront of what we do. Uh, just quick comment uh, to add to that. Uh, we have good news and bad news for you. Good news is you have easy access to a lot of information we never had before. Bad news is, uh, my prediction is that uh, our expectation of quality of your work will go up dramatically because to get to a certain level of work, quality of work, is any, anybody can do it very fast. But you know there is always a competition, so the expectation will go up. And you have to do extra work, to, you know, to make it outstanding. Uh, if I could take a picture, there were two points that you raised. Um, one about there's a diversity of backgrounds and perspectives in a classroom. That's always been the case and will continue, I hope, to be the case. But let's look at this question of research and saying, I will let um, a GPT sort through, summarize, for me, so I don't have to read the stuff myself. As a person who's done research for who knows how many decades, I can promise you that the things that I find to be relevant in an article, in a book, in a philosopher's work, are not necessarily what the summary said was most relevant. And that's a human summarizing, where now it's going to be an AI doing the summarizing. So uh, for my money, education is figuring out for yourself what's important, what is your perspective? What was that one line in an article that seemed to be a kind of throwaway, but to you is the most important thing about the study? And that's not gonna show up in all likelihood in the kind of production from an AI. Jerome, did you want to close this out? Yeah, just to piggyback off of everyone, I would say that I think for at least humanistic research, it's good to be a little bit of a hipster. And I think what that means is that you 
kind of have to read against the grain of the summaries that you provide. You kind of have to find the figures um, within the stacks uh, in the footnotes. Um, and this is how, as far as I understand it, uh, much of the interesting, compelling, high quality knowledge is produced. And therefore, um, yeah, I, I think that it is okay that more and more people can show up and uh, arrive at some of these conversations. Um, but to actually say something within these conversations that uh, can strike and grasp people, or maybe even speak to what's going on right now, or that can be compelling, you, you probably have to do the homework. What a great way to end. You probably have to do the homework. <laughs> so I just want to thank our panelists, Naomi, Guanhu, Gihan, Jerome, and Alison. Feel free to stay seated. Just I'll, I'm going to wrap up really quickly, but thank you so much. We're going to continue this conversation, not right now, but throughout the spring semester. Before you head to your other session, you, you're welcome to leave this stage now if you want to. Thank you so much again. Uh, before you leave, uh, feel free to uh, or consider stopping by Butler 300 over in that direction where the old bookstore used to be. Uh, this is the new home of the Disability Support and Academic Support um, areas. So that includes the Writing Center, Academic Coaching, Supplemental Instruction, and Peer Tutoring. I've been told there are cookies. They have cookies, according to Bridget, uh, so it must be true, uh, in addition to seeing the new space and meeting the staff, of course. And then also before we wrap up, if you could please take a moment to fill out the evaluation survey either online using this QR code. If you're on Zoom, there is a link in the chat. If you're in the room, there are little pieces of paper on the tables. I can use a traditional analog way of filling those out. And um, our next sessions begin at 2.45 p.m. And then also, I hope you enjoy these afternoon sessions and hope to see you back here for the dessert reception at 4.45. There's going to be a raffle. So if you haven't picked up your name tag, make sure to do so. That is your raffle ticket. We'll see you back here at 4.45. Thank you so much for coming.